Good morning, church. Hello. Happy Sunday. Um, I'm Andrea. I'm on staff here at Harvest Church. If we have not met yet, I just wanted to welcome you. If you are a first-time guest, we say welcome to the family when you're here. We hope that this place really starts to feel like home after a while. Um, if you could do us a favor and just take 30 seconds, there's an orange connection card that's found in the seat pocket in front of you. If you fill that out and just give it to one of our ushers or drop it in the box on the back of the wall, we would just love to connect with you and say hello and introduce ourselves. Um, and if you're joining us online, we say hi to you guys. If you're out at the uh, beach, perhaps, and I know the Blueberry Festival's going on in town, we have a few of our leaders that actually um, had some commitments there this morning as well. But um, we say welcome. So um, we just wanted to uh, have a few brief announcements. Um, as you can see, it's not every day here at Harvest. It doesn't always look like this. And I should probably also just pause to say, if you're fairly new or if you haven't heard, um, my husband, Pastor Jimmy, he was here two Sundays ago. He preached and then he shared that he needed to take a, a medical sabbatical um, for a few months. So if you had not heard that news, I just wanted to share that with you. Keep him in prayer, please. He's he's just struggling specifically today and yesterday just with some nausea and, and whatnot. So if you can just in your quiet time, just remember him. He, I know that our family would just covet that as well. But thank you. Um, we have a full lineup this summer of um, some really anointed uh, men and women that will just be bringing the word. So stay connected with us ministry still happens even without our shepherd, right? Um, we are the church. And I was reminded of that this week as we were preparing and setting up for VBS. And I said, this is what the body of Christ is about, right? When that one person that really knows how to make an amazing palm tree, Nancy Reese, she just got in there and she made us some handmade palm trees. And um, God bless Gloria Schoenbeck. She prepared a whole pot of chili for our entire staff, even though she was going on vacation. So that is what coming together, working together, using your gifts that God has equipped you to do just that when we all come together. We had a great time this week just getting to know each other better as we set up. So anyway, having said that, tonight, starting at 6 p.m., we invite you to Make Waves VBS. If you have a kiddo or an adult, Adult that likes to dress up, <laughs> you know you can always count on Sharon Dramisi for a good VBS promo. <laughs> Sharon, 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 Sharon. Uh, VBS is tonight. Nah. <laughs> no, but that's good. I'm glad you're ready, but come back ready. If you're a volunteer, Sharon, you're helping us out, right? That's awesome, awesome, then I want, yeah. Oh, she's falling. Can someone help Sharon out? <laughs> Sharon, Sharon, so ton. <laughs> she's served up. So Sharon, tonight, and for anyone who's helping, we're asking you to be here 5 o'clock p.m. We promise to feed you. Yes, feed you, and you help us with the kids. This is going to be a big event. We're going to need your help. If you want to help, it's not too late. See me if you want to help. Come here at 5, and we'll get you more details. Also, the VBS is not too late to sign up. If you know other kids, if you're at the Blueberry Festival, take some invite cards. Tell them they can sign up. Just bring them in. Bring them into your car and just drive them here. We're doing open sign up. It's going to be 6 to 8.30 um, today, so, um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're super excited. And it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. And you know what? Who knows what kind of adventures will happen? Who knows what lives can be changed when we take our time to talk to the kids? And who? Is that a... Oh, that's a, that's a shark. Um, uh, that's a, that's a sister, <laughs> that's a sister shark. Um, um, hey, hey, buddy, you're friendly, right? Right? No. Okay. Um, um, I hope you guys are good. Enjoy the message. Fabian, you're welcome to come up. I think there's a mic on stage. I'm leaving. See you at VBS tonight. Oh, we love our kids team here. Thank you, Sister Sharon. <laughs> um, so invite a neighbor. Kiddos, if you're here, invite a friend. Tomorrow night is bring a friend night. 
And Thursday night is water night, or Tuesday night is water night, and next Sunday is day five of our VBS. And so we're encouraging you, even if they come the very last day, next Sunday is our family day. And we have um, Pastor Andy Lynn with us next Sunday. We have a mission spot. We have the Kona ice truck coming, so you don't want to miss next Sunday. So this is why it's so key to invite a family this week to VBS so they can be part. Also, just wanted, if you are volunteering, you haven't picked up your um, crew shirt, see me right after the service and we need all hands on deck we have a lifeguard chair that is coming in that needs to get up on stage and all of these chairs have to be um also moved for tonight so if we could just have like a few key people to help us that we have some dollies and we'll put the chairs and we'll, we'll lead and direct that but we'd appreciate if you could just stay a few minutes to be able to do that um finally we thank you for your faithfulness and giving um as we say there's two ways you can give you can give online um on our harvestchurchnj.com page or there's boxes in the back of the sanctuary or you can um, uh, text to give with PayPal. So God bless you. And at this time, I want to invite up Fabian Kalapooch. I get the pleasure of working um, with our director of missions and youth ministries. He wears a lot of hats and <laughs> he uh, is a hard, hard working guy that is committed to just seeing all things move forward with Jesus. And he does a great job. So we're so grateful to have him here today. And his wife, Dawn, say hello to little Dawn. <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks. Yes, you too. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I have one. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Wow, this is great to be here. It's been about six or seven years, I think, since the last time I was here. It's been that long. But I came at the right time. I, you know what? So Andy gets the Kona ice truck? Like, what is up with that? So today, we, we yes. Like, yes. Oh, blueberry feather. Well, we're going to hit that up later, I think, on the way out. But it's good to be here. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Can you hear me all right? You know, I came in and I was uh, teasing with Rob and I felt like singing Otis Redding, you know. Somewhere, right, exactly. There's a couple other songs about boardwalk, but never mind. But anyways, um, it's good to be here. It really is. And uh, that little skit there kind of brought back some memories. Um, actually, this whole thing brings back some memories. Um, my, a couple of years, two, three years ago, my wife and I were in Cabo San Lucas and she coerced me to go um, parasailing. Yeah, first of all, I hate heights. Like, I don't like Ferris wheels, because you stand still. I'd give me a roller coaster in and out, 30 seconds, I'll do that with no problem. But anything I gotta stay up high a certain amount of time, I don't like that. I don't like tall buildings, I don't like any of that kind of stuff, right? And um, so, you know, Shaw, what could happen? If you fall, you're gonna, you know, hit the water, whatever. And, and I said, yeah, I said, but what's underneath there is what scares me, right? And so, we get up on this thing, and um, she pulls out my phone, not her phone, my phone, which happened to be the district's phone. So it's kind of like, oh, this is not good. Yeah. And she starts FaceTiming our daughter down in Florida to say, hey, look where mom and dad are, this kind of thing. You know? And I'm like, I'm white knuckling it. I'm just like, yo, this has got to come down. This has got to come down now. And then I look over at the boat, and the guys on the boat are going, hey, 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 hey look down. I look down. And this guy wasn't underneath us, but it was probably something about maybe two football fields lengths. Like there was a humpback whale right underneath us. And all of my fears, all of my fears of what would happen if I fall is right below me. And she's like, so cool. She's with the phone going like this. And I'm like, no, it's not cool. And I'm just kind of, we need to go down. And, and the guy on the boat is playing jokes. He's going down like this, up like that. And I'm just like, so anyways, um, had some memories today with that shark coming in. Hopefully we won't have any, um, any major uh, animals coming through. But uh, my wife's here with me. It's good to, good to have her with us. We, um, we have three great kids, 28 uh, out of Philly, Fishtown area. Then uh, my middle one is married out in Minneapolis. Jesse and them are all there together. They find wives out in Minneapolis, whatever. God bless them. Um, no, ba no grandkids yet. Can somebody help me with that? It's like, you've been married two years. Come on, work, work with it, would you? Two, two years, you should have a grandkid, right? Right? And then, uh, then our baby, our youngest, uh, just graduated with her master's out of Southeastern and uh, informed us that she's moving back to Tampa to take a job. Which uh, So uh, that's kind of our life. And, uh, you know, life is good. Can't complain about it. Um, I heard the bishop was here last week. He, uh, I, I spoke with him on Friday. and uh, Oh, I need to be online. But uh, Brother Coletti, who uh, has been a dear uh, spiritual father to me and my wife, as a matter of fact, 
probably 1994 was the first time we walked through the doors of this church uh, visiting with him. And uh, so he just, he said he loved his time here. So you're not going to get a Brother C message. I apologize about that. I'm not as masterful as he is. But I believe that God has given us a word for today. And um, I love the theme, Making Waves, because we're going to make some waves. Is that okay? You always bring in the youth director to make waves. Um, but uh, the, the honest truth is when Andrea asked me to share um, she had told me you were in the middle of, of dealing about legacy. And I think legacy in one way or another, you, you make waves, right? Somehow you make waves as a, as a legacy. It's a, it's a negative connotation to make waves. Has anybody ever heard that? Like this week, uh, the Supreme Court has made some waves, <laughs> right? Okay, some good, positive waves. Amen. Amen. Anytime there's a victory for life, and, and, and there are other issues that people deal with, and trust me, I, I'm sensitive to both sides, but I believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, and the Word of God speaks life, it breathes life. So anytime life wins, it's a big win. And so, uh, you know, we, we do need to hope and help and bring hope to those that don't know the life that we talk about. So just understand that as we are living in a day and age, yes, let's celebrate the life that was one, and, and the, the, different that takes, the, the different things that have happened. But let's also be quick to minister to those who need the hope, uh, that don't, don't understand the hope of life that we do. Amen? So that's all I'm going to say about that. But I, I want to share about legacy and making waves. And, and the individual that I think is probably the best character in the Bible, probably my favorite Bible character. There are some other ones that are obscure, but this... This particular individual I've loved, I've studied his lifetime in and time out, and, and I really enjoy it. And it's on the life of David. And so um, I, I really want to get out to Lancaster. I heard it's a great, uh, it's a great sight, sound one of the best uh, on, on the life of David. But legacy, what does legacy mean, right? Legacy, if we define legacy, legacy is something, all right, such as property or money that is received from someone who has died. That's what one of the definitions is. I'm from Argentina, and I ha heard a couple years ago that my grandparents left me a little piece of property in Argentina. Our kids are all excited. They're like, hey, let's go see it. I said, you really don't. I mean, it's nothing. It, it's great. But, Dad, we own a property in Argentina. This is amazing, right? So that's the kind of legacy that people leave. Other people leave legacies in, 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 the, in the bank account and different things like that. But I think the greatest way to leave a legacy is to leave something to remember, something to live by. And so when we, when, when, when we look at the life of David, we, we understand that he was a man who left a great legacy. He made waves. David made waves, and, and, and we can make waves as well. So in Acts chapter 13, um, verses 22 to 23, we're going to read that passage of Scripture, and then we're going to kind of go through a little his, uh, biological sketch of, of, of David's life and, and kind of pull a few points from that. But in Acts chapter 12, verses 22 through 23, it says this, After removing Saul, God, he, made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. That's a legacy. I mean, come on. <laughs> you want to talk about a legacy? That's a legacy. To be told in the book of Acts that you were a man after God's own heart and that through your li through your li what am I doing wrong? Oh, yes. Okay. And through, so i got to sing like, ah! Um, through, through, your, through, through, the lineage, through the lineage of David came the Messiah. That is a legacy. And, but it's not just the lineage. It's not just the bloodline of David, but it is the attitude that David had. A heart after God's, a, a, a man after God's own heart. Let's look at David's story for a little bit, all right? David's story can be summarized pretty simple. It's, it's a nobody who becomes a somebody who then becomes a fugitive and ends up being the king of Israel. That's a cool story, right? I mean, that's amazing. How many would love, you know, how many would love that? Like, I, I think of Mike Trout at a little old Millville, right? He's playing for the, for the California Angels. I think of other individuals who come out of different obscure locations, and, and they're, they're doing great and awesome things. And David came out of nowhere and became uh, the king of Israel. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the city of David to this day is, is, is Jerusalem, right? We, we know it as the city of David. And there, there are 66 chapters in the Bible, 66 different chapters that mention the name David. As a matter of fact, th there are more references to David in the Bible than any other biblical character. Talk about a legacy. That's a legacy. You know, David's life story is amazing. It's a story of extremes. 
I shared a little bit about it. If we can kind of just do like a zoom in, kind of like the trailer to the movie. How many love trailers in the movies, right? You, usually a trailer will say, should I watch it or should I not watch it, you know? As some of you are excited about Thor. I know that's coming up and some others. But when you see that trailer, you're like, okay, I'm going to see that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to see that. So let me just give you a little trailer of, of, of the story today. In David's early life, he went from seclusion to fame. He, he went from being a nobody to somebody. We talked about that. He, he went from being the runt of the family to being the most powerful man in the nation, right? And then if we look at the middle years when he became king. He went from, from, from hero to fugitive because his son Absalom wanted to take the throne from him. He, he went from celebrated to despised. They sang thousands. David is, uh, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And the next thing you know, the king, king Saul, who actually was, was, was uh, his father-in-law, wanted him dead. From loyal servant to traitor. Then we see in the later years, from fugitive to a king, from a cave to a palace. All these things we summarize in extremes. It's kind of like an up and down life. How many can relate to an up and down life? These last three or four years have been up and down, up and down. Masks, no masks. This is that. Okay, whatever, finally. And then another wave comes in. Then another wave comes in. Waves. Waves come in on a negative thing. But then waves can be made positively, right? And that's what we're here to talk about. See, he's slaying giants one day, and then he's acting like a crazy man. He's living in, the, in poverty and then in riches. He's in a palace and then in a cave. He, he could play the harp and enter into the presence of God like nobody. And Robin, thank you so much today. That was so precious just to bring us into the presence of God. David could worship Jesus, come into the presence of God, and then make a decision to sleep with somebody and ruin everything. That sounds so human. Sounds so relatable to, to you and I and to where we are today. You see, it tells me that we have an impact on the, fa- on the choices that we make with our family. In other words, the choices that we make today will affect generations and generations and generations. I, there was a man by, by the name of Matteo Scherba, who in 1942, as an atheist running from the war in Europe, landed in a place called Asuncion, Paraguay, and walked into a, uh, a, a revival service by a guy, uh, I think his name was Tommy, I forget, what, a revivalist at the time, um, who, who preached a message, and, and Mateo went forward and gave his heart to the Lord and left alcohol and left his life as an atheist. And my grandfather, my grandfather, Mateo Scherba, became a God-fearing man of God on my mom's side. Very similar story with my parents' side. So the choices that we make take on a history within our life, within our names. And, and so as we move that on, what are we pulling from here? What is the thing that David did? David's life tells a story, and it's not always fair. It's not always fair. There are times when things happen to us that are not necessarily fair. That's why we sing the songs that we sing. I'm going to fight on my knees. I'm going to fight against the giants. I'm going to fight against the different things that are there. There are times when those decisions are beyond our control and life isn't fair. But then there's times where favor comes upon us, and that's just not as fair as anything else either. Favor isn't fair. Can somebody say amen to that? Why does so-and-so do well, and why does so-and-so not do well? We can't, we're not here to determine that. But I can tell you this. That where you see the favor of God, you look behind, there's a legacy. There's somebody making waves in their relationship with God. Because God is that kind of a God. It tells me that our families are impacted. David was noted as a man after God's own heart. And that's where the legacy of what I want to share with you today. That's how you, you want to make waves in the community. You want to make waves within your family. You want to make waves on a positive note. Then be a man after God's own heart. I, I, believe it or not, the Supreme Court was after God's own heart, because God's own heart is life. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Guess what? They made waves. <laughs> all right? You can see it all over the place. You make waves by making right decisions. You make waves by making wrong decisions as well. But usually those wrong decisions, those waves, can be very detrimental to whoever they impact. But these kind of waves, they're amazing. These waves go on and on and on and on. Let's see the three things that we read out of the life of David in making a legacy for ourselves. Number one is a heart devoted to God. When you study David's life, you discover that he came from an isolated place where no one knew his name. It wasn't Cheers, those of you that are older. Okay, it wasn't that bar where everybody knows your name. No, it was a place where nobody knew his name. As a matter of fact, if we kind of read the story, 
Israel had Samuel as their political king, as their spiritual leader, as their political leader, as their spiritual leader, and Israel wanted a king. Israel wanted a king so bad. Israel wanted to be like the rest of the world, so they said, give us a king. And God said, okay, that's what you want. I'll give you a king. And in there, we read about the story of Saul. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was this great kingly looking guy. He probably looked like LeBron James or The Rock, whoever you want to look at, whatever a king should look like, right? He didn't look like Napoleon. He looked like something big, something huge. He was amazing in outward appearance. But guess what? His heart was far from God. As a matter of fact, he fell pretty quickly. And we saw he went from being the, the hero of Israel to being the villain of Israel and bringing judgment upon Israel. And, and so God, this is, this is what's crazy, is probably the worst passage of scripture that I could ever want for anybody. And he regretted that he made Saul king. That's sad, right? And, and, and so after he makes Saul king, or after Saul disappoints God, Samuel hears from God and says, listen, I want you to go to the house of Jesse. And this is where we pick up that story. It was back in the fields where he developed a fully devoted heart to God. First Samuel chapter 16, verses 11 through 13, read as follows. So he asked Jesse, he's at the house, he's, he's, he's seen all of Jesse's sons. He's seen the strong guys, he's seen the, the good looking guys, he's seen the guys that are outward personality, he's seen everybody that possibly had what it looks like on the outward appearance to be king has gone before him, and guess what? God keeps saying, nope, that's not the one, nope, that's not the one, nope, that's not the one. So Samuel asked Jesse, hey, none of these guys are, are really worth it, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him, and he had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and a handsome feature. Then the Lord said, arise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from the, that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. That looks like a great picture, right? I mean, here he is. Okay, he's cute. He's handsome. He's 12 years old. Who knows, who knows what he, he's the guy, right? He's Justin Bieber looking. I don't know what you want to call that. But whatever he is, he's, he's it. But if we look deeper into this, it's more, there's more negative in that passage than there is positive. Because this, let, let's look, the youngest. Oh, I have, I have a son. He's the youngest. And the word, the Hebrew word there in that particular passage for youngest is the word hokadon, which means insignificant. So it's not like, hey, I've got my youngest. No, no, I've got an insignificant one. I've got one that we're embarrassed of. I've got one that really you don't want to meet. He is the youngest. He's the little brat. He's the one. He, he, we don't even know who he belongs to is basically what some commentators have said. Some said that David was actually an illegitimate child, okay? But this is the kind of person that David is. He comes from an obscure place. Not only does he have that about him, but he's tending sheep. He's tending sheep. Have you ever been to like where they tend sheep? You know, here in the United States, it's nice. It's all flat land. Go to Scotland, where they tend sheep. It's a little different. Go to Israel, where they tend sheep. It's not nice and easy. It's not just easy work to tend sheep. Go to some of the countries in Europe where the shepherds have got to climb hills that are pretty far. It's not an easy task. And nobody, not the greatest of people do it, but it's usually the lowest of the low that are there. It's the, it's the lowest income in most places. I'll never forget being in Scotland with Dave Goldschmidt, our missionary, and uh, we, we were on this one place. I'm watching these sheep on this mountain that, like, I mean, it's like this way, and they're standing like this, looking down a hill. And, and I look to the side, and there's guys that never made it, and they're on the side of the creek dead, that kind of stuff. It's hard to, to do that. And he gets pulled from what he's doing. He, he's the baby brother. He's the insignificant one. He's out in the middle of nowhere. But the single most characteristic that we read about David is that at this point is his life in God. We read all of the Psalms that he wrote while he was a shepherd, and we, he had that one connection with God that nobody else had. As a matter of fact, David believed in God, he thought about God, he imagined God, he addressed God, and he prayed to God on a regular basis. David believed that, that the largest part of his existence wasn't David, but it was God. What's interesting is when we look at other Bible characters, we look at Moses. Moses, man, he threw a stick down, it became a snake, right? He went to the ocean opened up the sea, they went through. We look at Elijah, Elijah threw an axe uh, into the water, the handle, the, the, the axe head comes up. Miracles. There is not one miracle performed in the life and ministry of David. 
People say, well, what about Goliath? No, that wasn't a miracle. That was, you want to call it an underdog fight, whatever you want to call it. That guy didn't die by lightning coming down and that kind of thing. No, he died, died by two rocks coming, hitting him between the head. There's different stories in the life. David never had a miracle. No miracle in David's life. The absence of any recorded miracle emphasizes the possibilities of any ordinary, everyday life can be infused with the divine. Think about that for a moment. If you're waiting for miracles to happen in your life, why wait? That one of the most significant people made waves without any miracles. The most incredible thing in his life wasn't the powerful acts of God. It was the heart of God that he desired and the heart of God that he looked after on a regular basis. You see, he didn't need the miracles to have a relationship with God. And I think too many of us need the miracles to have a relationship with God. If he doesn't do anything for us except for die on Calvary, that's enough. Are you, are you with me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So how do we develop this, this, this uh, devoted heart to God? It's a heart that's in tune with God, a heart that listens, a heart that hears, a heart that understands, a heart that begins to act. I love this quote that I came across. Resist the convenience of memorizing Jesus. Instead, do the hard work and become like him. Because mm. even the devil knows what to say and how to say and what to do. Let me go back at that quote. Resist the convenience of memorizing Jesus. Instead, do the hard work of becoming like him. I, I, I have friends that are from Canada, and they all say, hey, it's truth, right? Anytime I hang around with my friends from Canada, I start sounding like I'm from Canada because I spent time with them. Are you with me? My wife, when I met her, would say, pock the ka, is a snick as a bar. She's from Providence, Rhode Island. Okay? After being married for 30 years, that does not come out unless she gets mad at me. Okay, but she's been in, around people long enough where it changes how you talk, how you act, how you behave. And so a heart in tune with God is the next thing that I want to talk to you. His one-on-one -on -one encounters with the Lord in the fields developed his mature heart. Psalm 23 was written out of a tough time in his life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That didn't just come by some amazing miracle. No, he was going through things and he was connected to the God. He was in tune with that, uh, with, with, with God. Uh, to become fully devoted to God happens first in your private time with the Lord. You're never going to go public. You're never going to make waves in public if you don't have that time with God, if you don't bask in his presence on a regular basis. I love what Psalms 46.10 says. It says that he, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Sometimes all we need to do is just shut up and listen to what God is saying. We talk a lot, don't we? How about we just listen? Well, I love when David says, incline your ear. Not recline your ear, incline your ear. Step in. Listen to what the Spirit is saying. Be in tune with what God is saying. Now listen, it's not just David. If it was David, we could sit there, well, Jesus didn't do that. No, Jesus did that more than we know. Jesus retreated from the crowd a lot of times to spend time with his Father. He went up to the mountains to pray when he sent the, uh, the, the disciples across the sea. And then performs incredible miracles because we have to connect with who God is. Jesus reflects the importance of solitude with God. We need to have that as well. And it needs to happen in private. It needs to happen daily. It needs to be something, again, David did not just worship God before he killed the giant. No, that was something that was happening way before. David didn't do the great things that he did as king instantaneous. No, it was something that somebody trained for. I mean, we, we all saw the movie Rocky, right? I mean, you know how so Philadelphia, right? You've got you to be in that, okay? I'm still a Giants fan, for those of you who are wondering. I'm still a Giants fan. All right, those of you online, I'm still a Giants fan. But, but, but the, the Rocky movies, how they trained, how, they work, how he worked, how he got, got ready to go. It's interesting, but a couple of years ago, I remember this story. Stevie Johnson, I don't know if anybody remembers the name Stevie Johnson. Any football fans? Right? Do you remember him? He, did he make a wave? Yeah, he made a wave, but that wave disappeared real quick. Let me share you what, you what Stevie Johnson did. In the year 2010, all right, the, the Buffalo Bills are, are playing a game, and Stevie Johnson drops a pass that, like, nobody was covering him in the end zone. He just drops the pass. After the game, he goes on Twitter, and he says, God, how dare I glorify you, and you allow me to drop that pass. Those were his words. He created waves on the Twitter field, right? 
And, and, and we all know, oh, ooh, wow, you know, football player, right? And you're sitting there going, what in the world is this guy thinking? Chris Carter, who we all know Chris Carter on ESPN, those of you who are football fans, said this. Stevie Johnson did not drop that pass this Sunday. He dropped it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at practice. Because, and we all remember Allen Iverson, practice? Who needs practice? We need practice. We constantly practice. We constantly are in the presence of the Lord. We're in the presence of the Lord when things are great and wonderful and, and, and everything's great. And then in those times when it's dry and barren, we go back just like David did in Psalm 63 where he longed to be in the presence of the Lord even though he was nowhere near the temple like he used to be. You see, those are the things. When we do it regularly, you see, his heart was so in tune with God that he feared nothing, nothing, because he knew where his strength came from and that strength came from the presence of God. So number one, right, if you're taking notes, a heart devoted to God. Number two, a heart in tune with God. Number three, a fearless heart for God. Oh, I, just, I, I love the fact that you started with that song today because it just confirmed with me that this is where we're at. We're all facing giants. Every one of us faces the giants that you face are, the different, are different than the giants that I face. Some are facing medical giants. Some are facing financial giants. We're all facing the gas giant, okay? We're all facing that one, all right? And I don't know if 18 cents off is going to help anything, but just, you know, every time I look at it, I, I, I look at the gas attendants, and I go, are you being treated okay? Do people, like, get mad at you? They're like, oh, you should, you'd be surprised how people get mad at us. So be nice to the gas attendants, okay? Because it's not their fault, right? It's not their fault. It's not Wawa's fault, right? Who knows whose fault it is? But the, the gas, whatever, whatever giants we're facing, Whatever giants we're facing, God can give us that strength, right? Again, it was not at that moment that he decided he would go against, uh, against the giant. He decided he would go against the giant long before that. You see, commitment is this. Can I be honest with you with what commitment is? Commitment is not a 50-50 shot. Do I do it or do I not? Should I stay or should I go? What do I do here? Commitment is knowing what the answer is before the question is ever posed. Can I repeat that so you get that? Commitment is understanding and knowing what the answer is before the question is ever posed. Been married 30 years to this beautiful woman. Whether I wear this ring or not doesn't make any difference. But it's a reminder to me. It's a reminder to me that there's a decision that I made before anything is ever posed to me on that way. That's what commitment is. Are you, are you with me on that? So David's commitment had nothing to do with the giant he faced, had nothing to do with the circumstances that were before us. And we as believers, we have to live that same way. We don't commit ourselves to serving Jesus when things are great, and then when things are bad, we, we shout, shout back. No, we have that commitment whether things are great or whether they're not. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 37. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Let me again paint the picture because this is just the way I process things, all right? He's been anointed king, all right? He's been anointed king, and his father says to him, hey, David, I need you to go out to the battlefield, and I need you to take cheese sandwiches to your brother. I used to think they were ham and cheese, but then I realized, no, Jewish people don't eat ham. So it was just cheese sandwiches, right? So I need you to take these sandwiches out to your brothers. And first of all, David could have looked at his dad and said, hey, no, nah, you know what? I'm the king. The king doesn't bring cheese sandwiches to his brothers. They should bring cheese sandwiches to me, right? I mean, that's kind of how we think. That's how we process. Dad, weren't you here when Samuel anointed me king over Israel? Dad, what are you talking about? You want me to go and to do what? <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you with me here, right? Because, and David didn't do that. What David did is like, okay, Dad, I'll do that. And David goes, and here's what I'm saying to you. Here's the principle. Go ahead and serve sandwiches. You might beat a giant. Hello? Stack chairs after service for VBS. You might be the giant. Are you, are you with me? Pick up papers, whatever the case might be. The most menial tasks there are, do them and do them ask to the Lord because you never know what kind of opportunities God opens up for you. That's a freebie. That's not even part of the notes. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go and fight against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off his sheep from the flock, 
I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. He's basically saying Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Jesus rescued me before, you notice how he doesn't give glory to himself. He says, if God rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he didn't say, I did this, I did that. No, if God rescued me from the paw of the bear, the paw of the lion, he will surely give me the victory over this giant. You see what I'm saying here? So it's those small little battles. It's those small times that we are in tune with God, that we are devoted to God, that we get that fearless heart for God. Now, in 1 John 4, 15 and 18, it says this, If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he is in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. How powerful. Those, those are the weapons we have. Those are the weapons that we have. We don't fight with our fists. We fight with the power of the Holy Spirit. We fight with that confidence. We fight with that courage that God has given us, that courage to face a culture that is staring us down, that courage to face uh, an economy that can, that, that, that can tank us, that courage that faces a, a, a divorce situation that we, it seems hopeless when it stares us down, that courage within us gives us the strength to do what God needs to do. Now, can we be honest? Sometimes we take faith and we define faith as something faith was never meant to be. Faith was never meant to be, I get what I want. That didn't go over too well. Am I making waves? It's not name it and claim it. It's not, hey, I said it, so I'm going to walk in it and this and that. Yes, there's an authority that we walk in, but it's not our authority. It's God's authority, right? Can I say that faith isn't necessarily getting what you want or what you desire as much as faith is belief and trust in the one who holds the outcome? Let me go back and say that. Faith isn't in the outcome. Faith is belief and trust in the one who holds the outcome. And even if the outcome doesn't turn out quite like we want it, it's going to be okay because he knows what's best for us. Romans 8.28 says, For all things work together for the good of them that are called according to his plan and to his purpose. So when I face a giant, when I face my fears, I have to be confident in one thing, the God who I serve, the God who I have a relationship, the God who I've been in tune with, the God whose my heart is devoted to, the God who my heart is after, like David, being a man after God's own heart, that's where I trust. And you've heard it said before, I don't even know if it's um, it, it, what group it is, Mercy Me, or um, one of the other groups that's, that sings, when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. That's exactly how we have to live our lives. Years ago, Wycliffe Bible translators in the jungles of Colombia and Brazil and the Amazon jungles, they would train their missionaries. For those of you who aren't familiar with Wycliffe Bible translators, Wycliffe has translated the Bible into many more, more languages than any other organization. They would go and find out the dialect of indigenous people and they would learn that language and they would come back and they would translate it. So their missionaries were taught how to kill an anaconda. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. How many want to know how to kill an anaconda? Okay. This is, this is a true story now. Um, an anaconda can grow to about 8, 9, 10, sometimes 15 feet. It's about 200 pounds. And it basically, the way an anaconda works, an anaconda is so fast you can't outrun it. It'll, it'll swipe its tail around, trip you up, and pretty much swallow you whole. That's how an anaconda works, okay? He doesn't strangle you. That's the boa constrictor. Some, some of you are getting squeamish here, right? Um, the, the anaconda basically swallows you whole. This is what they told the missionaries. They said, listen, when you come face to face with the anaconda, don't run away from it. Don't run away from it. You'll never, never be able to run away from it. Basically, what they told the missionaries, they said, listen, lie down, feet first, and allow the snake to swallow you.
Not me. No, right? Not me. How many, how many would do that? Like, you know, before or after I pee in my pants, right? <laughs> okay. But here's what, they told, here's what they said to him. They said, listen, and when he gets to your hip, the knife in your pocket, take it directly up and scramble his brain, and it releases you. So what is, you're sitting there going, Pastor, what are you saying? I love this. I have faith to walk on this here. What, what, what am I saying? I'm saying that we can't run away from our fears. We can try, but they'll always catch up to us. But if we face our fears like David faced his fear after being devoted to God, after being in tune with God, and that's the key. You see, the missionary needed to know how to use that knife. If you did not know how to use that knife, you were in trouble, right? And if you don't know how to use the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, oh, there you go, uh-huh. If you use the sword of the Spirit the way God intended the sword of the Spirit to be used, there is no demon in hell that you can't face. There is no situation that you can't face because the power of the Spirit of the Word of God changes everything. Changes everything. When you, whether you look at the temptation of Jesus and you see that when Jesus was tempted, he was baptized, he was baptized in water. I think it was the coolest thing in the world. I would have loved, there's so, so many things. How many of you would like, like me, you'd love to be like at these places? That's why I thought the Chosen did such a good job with some of the things that they did, right, in the show. But I mean, I wish I was at the baptism of Jesus. We're like, hallelujah. You know, the, 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 the dove comes down and you hear God say, this is my son who I'm well pleased with. That was amazing. Did you notice that when he went into the wilderness and was tempted by the enemy, he never once referred back to the baptism? He never once said, hey, did you see what happened? God said this to me. God, you know, I, I felt good there. The heavens opened up. You remember the bird coming down and talking to me? No, no, no. What did he do? He went scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. And if we don't know scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, guess what? That wave hits us and takes us out. But I want to be a person after God's own heart. I want to be devoted to God when it's not in public. I want to be in tune with God when life is out of tune. And I want to be in the strength of God and the strength of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm a young person at heart. I don't look young anymore, but I love rock music. I do. Switchfoot's my favorite rock band, Christian rock band, whatever. But they have a song that, that just it speaks volumes. I want to sing a lifelong song. Sometimes the words come out right. Sometimes the words come out wrong. I'm not living for a funeral. I'm living for eternity. I have one life to live. And I want to live it well. I want to leave a legacy for my kids. I want to leave a legacy for another generation. I don't want at my funeral... For my kids to say, hear people say, oh, your dad was a great preacher. Yeah, but he was like the worst father in the world. I don't ever want, that's my biggest fear. You want to know Fabian's biggest fear? That's his biggest fear. I want my kids to be able to say, you know what? He tried, he loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loved our mom, and he loved us. That's legacy. I might never show them the little piece of property in Argentina. <laughs> I'm going to leave them probably with 50 bucks in my pocket. I'm going to be buried with the bullhorn that I used for 25 years at camp. That's what I asked our camp staff at my funeral. I want the old, and Abner knows what, what bullhorn I'm talking about. That's the legacy, that's the physical legacy that I have, but the spiritual legacy that I made waves in the lives of my kids and in my family and as many people that I could, that's what I want to be known for. What do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for just being one who talks, 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 talks and never listens and doesn't have compassion and doesn't bring hope to a world that's dying? These four walls are great. They're wonderful. I love it. Sign looks amazing. Harvest Church. I haven't seen it in six years. Great. I was like, am I in the right place? Yes, I'm in the right place. This is great. Beautiful. But this is all outward. Inward. What's the legacy? What's the legacy when you, when you talk to somebody? Do they know that you've been in tune with God? Do you speak with that Canadian accent? How you doing, eh? Is Jesus coming out of you? Again, David wasn't perfect. Can we be straightforward? 
He wasn't perfect. He messed up big time. His family paid for it. But in Acts, years, hundreds of years later, we don't see the author of the book of Acts saying, David slept with Bathsheba, and he allowed his son to do this, and the family got messed up. No, we read that he was a man after God's own heart. And I want to be that person. I want to leave that legacy. I want to make waves. Who else wants to make waves in this place? Stand to your feet if you want to make waves. Amen. We're going to pray. You're sitting there going, what a way to end this thing. I'm just waiting for the seagulls to come out and get, get, my, get my funnel cake or whatever it is. Harvest Church, you're amazing. Live up to your name. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. There's too many help wanted signs outside. And you know why those help wanted signs are outside? Because the government took care of us. And they took care of us so good that we don't want to work. Mm, yeah, get ready because I'm going to hit you across the head with this one. Jesus has taken care of you so well. So well. Don't you dare. Don't you dare not do the work of the kingdom in making waves and in finding people and sharing the love of Jesus and living the legacy of being a man after God's own heart. Don't just take in the blessings where you don't give out to people because you're just going to be just like the rest of the world. My prayer is that there's no help wanted sign outside of Harvest Church, but that this church realizes the harvest of, of, of Hamilton and Atco and all the communities in this area. And today at the Blueberry Festival, as you're smiling at people, you might not even say a word, but there's like something different about you. Yeah, hey, come on out to VBS. It's amazing. It's going to be a great time. That's what we're talking about. That's legacy. Are you a man after God's own heart? Are you a woman after God's own heart? Because if you are, that's all the legacy you need. Lord, we thank you for today. We praise you for this opportunity, Lord, just to be in your house, Lord. Thank you for the exciting things, Lord. God, there's so much excitement in this building, Lord. We, we sense it today. Thank you for the beautiful presence, even as Andrea had said, and, and Lord, the worship, Lord God. Father, our heart's desire is to be in tune with you. Our heart's desire is to leave a legacy, Father, a legacy to those that we come in contact with, a legacy, O oh Lord, not of riches, a legacy not of wealth, not of fame, but a legacy of attitude, desire, and Lord, more than anything, a legacy that makes waves. Lord, I pray for each person that's here today. Lord, I pray for those, and maybe we could do this today. I don't know why. We're kind of finishing a little early. I got about five minutes before the clock goes. Is there anyone today that just, you're facing a giant? You're, you're facing a giant, and, and that giant doesn't look too great right now. I'm here to tell you that, lie down, pull the Word of God out, quote the Word of God. That Word of God has power. That Word of God, again, face that fear. I'm not telling you to run from that fear. I'm not telling you to run from that giant. I'm saying, sit, look at that giant face to face. And that's what David said, I don't come to you. By the power of the army of Israel and King Saul, I come to you in the power of the name of God. In the power of the word of God. I come to you in the power of peace. I come to you in the power of love. I come to you in the power of joy. I come to you in the power of healing that is Jesus. Oh, one of the most beautiful songs I've heard. Just speak the name of Jesus. I was singing that coming down 206 today. Speak the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is the Word of God incarnate. He's that knife on the side of your hip that when that snake begins to swallow you, you just speak the name of Jesus. You speak the name of Jesus. So whatever you're going through, if it's a physical need today, if we could just maybe throw some background music on, that'd be great. But, but if you need prayer today, I want to pray with you. I want, I want to believe God with you. I'm not perfect. David wasn't perfect. We're not perfect. But God is perfect. Amen? So if you have a physical need, maybe a spiritual need, maybe, maybe there's a, a relational situation going on, but, but tonight, today, you want to just come forward for just a, a few moments of prayer. I want to invite you. I want to pray with you. As that music begins, just step out of your seat. If you need prayer, if you need to face that giant, you're not going to face that giant alone. David didn't face that giant alone. David faced that giant with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anyone else? Come on.
Anyone else just wants to just come up out of your seat right now? Amen. Uh-huh.